Welcome everyone. I am Ashanti Edwards, the Director for Professional Development at the American Society for Cell Biology. We are pleased to offer online with LSC as part of ASCP's Professional Development Webinar Series. Today, our facilitator will be Aaron Shortledge, who will introduce our featured author for this installment of Online with LSE. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this week's Online with LSE and introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Deidre Riding. She is currently the Executive Director of Northeastern University's Advanced Office of Faculty Development in Boston. Um, she started the work that she'll be presenting today while at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, working as a student research training manager under a collaborative National Cancer Institute collaborative grant. And I am going to turn it over to Deidre to share some of her work with us. And then we will be happy to have you put questions in the chat, which we will um, get to after Deidre's presentation. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to share this work and to engage in discussion. I am presenting this work on behalf of a multidisciplinary, multicultural team of scientists and educators from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, which is the most diverse higher education university in New England, and the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. I'd like to highlight our graduate students who worked on this project, Jamie Dombach in biology, Janine Cook, and Mike Walker, who are in education. They, along with Marlena Duncan, who has a doctorate in science education, contribute, contributed significantly to the creation of the content for the course, as well as the tools to evaluate the course. Our team came together really out of mutual interest and mission in increasing persistence of underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. We came together to write a grant that was funded by the National Research Mentoring Network. And the goal of that grant was to make explicit concepts and strategies within science culture that contribute to STEM persistence. Decades of research suggests that these interrelated aspects of science culture, scientific communication, mentoring relationships, and social identities can act as gatekeepers to determine whether who persists in STEM fields. For example, we all know that the ability to effectively communicate one science across a variety of audiences is a key determining factor in whether a scientist will succeed. Mentors play an instrumental role in teaching the skills needed to communicate effectively to their mentees. However, mentees often find it easier to disseminate these skills to mentees who are of their same social background. Thus, we combined these concepts into a course communicating for communicating in science for undergraduates. This two credit elective really um, is a semester long course that it, we employed a flipped model for. What that means is that all of the work of learning and doing the exercises in terms of preparing slides, um, reading papers happened outside of the course as pre-work. Students came to the course prepared to discuss, practice, and give and receive feedback to their peers. We recruited students broadly across University of Massachusetts Boston campus to participate in this course. The course, the only course requirement that we had was that students be engaged at, in research project throughout the duration of the class. We were able to have 33 students participate in the course and 97% of them were upperclassmen, STEM majors, majority of them were STEM majors and had high GPAs. 
for 70% of these students, this the, the research project they were engaging in during the course was their first project and they had been doing that project for less than a year. The majority of them had graduate students as mentors and worked on basic science projects. Because of how we recruited for the course, many of them, 58%, were also engaged in research training programs. And majority of them, 55% or over half, wanted to aspire to go to graduate school after they graduate. Importantly, for our purposes in increasing persistence in STEM, the majority of the social identities fall into the groups that are underrepresented in STEM, 70% uh, of them. So as I mentioned, the ability to communicate one's science is probably one of the most important tools that a scientist can, can gain. And this was really the foundation of our course in terms of we spent the majority of the time during the course working in this area. Students, the, the main concepts that we were trying to impart to students were that communicating one science is important, that it can be learned through practice, and that understanding one's audience is really the key to landing the message. We emphasize that students really know how to explain not just what their science was, but why it mattered in simple ways. We also emphasized that the way one gets better at communicating their science is through feedback. The process really began on day one. One of the first things that students had to do in the course was to give a 30 to 60 second introduction of their work. And honestly, from the first day to the last, there was a dramatic difference in our, our just ability to understand what people were talking about in the chorus. So students joined, they really, they also were gaining understanding of their project, but they weren't able to really articulate that sort of what they're doing and why it matters. But by the end of the course, they definitely were. And this wasn't just in uh, the introductions, which were 30 to 60 seconds. They were also able to write effective abstracts as well as create slide decks and have a culminating experience, which was a 10 minute oral presentation. So we collected videos and actual artifacts of all of their practice attempts as well as those final presentations. And graduate students use rubrics to evaluate and score that work. And what we noticed was that there was a significant increase in students' ability to get their message across in written and oral forms. What is perhaps even more striking is how much confidence students were able to gain throughout this process. They really understood that they had the skills and the capability to deliver a good talk to a variety of audiences. One student said, now I feel as though I know the process to be able to make a really well thought out and executed presentation that really can capture the audience by telling a story. Another student wrote, I think my capabilities have improved significantly over the semester. I now try to focus on the audience as I prepare my presentation and try to focus on the takeaway message. The next concept that we integrated into the course was this idea that 
Mentoring relationships are ex essential to su career success. And we imparted a sense of agency in the students that they actually are empo empowered and are capable to impact the trajectory of those mentoring relationships. We did this through imparting skills on how to have conversations with mentors. We gave them several questionnaires that they filled out by interviewing their mentors to gain comfort level in, that, in those relationships. We also, students also realized that feedback was an important way that they could learn within the relationships with their mentors and therefore they became more comfortable with receiving feedback from their mentors. Now, as we all know, mentoring relationships don't always go well. <laughs> uh, so we equipped students with uh, methods to have difficult conversations with their mentors and still maintain the relationship. What we observed through pre and post survey self-reported comfort levels with relationships, we observed a modest increase in students' comfort level with discussing their goals with their mentors, navigating difficult conversations with their mentors, and receiving feedback from their mentor. In fact, this receiving feedback is really the most um, significant, not statistically, but significant um, change we saw. Uh, if you notice, there's a complete flip-flop in comfort level between uh, moving from just comfortable to very comfortable. So obviously they started out feeling pretty comfortable, but still were able to gain comfort from what we taught in the class. I think student voices really do share the, the nuance and, and the real depth of uh, the learning in this area and the growth and comfort level in this area. Since I took this class, the interaction with my mentor has become a lot more solid. We are able to communicate effectively about our progress and expectations while still being critical about our work. And another student wrote, this course has helped me get closer to my mentor and learn things about her that I never would have otherwise. Oftentimes, mentors are busy and it may be uncomfortable to get to know your mentor, but this class created a place of open and open up situation to do that. The final pillar, the social identities, um, we really tried to impart this for the students, this idea that, you know, we're not just in this situation as scientists where our identities don't matter. Uh, everyone shows up with a social identity some of those social identities, they try to check at the door. Others, they can't check at the door, and, but they all have an impact on the way we learn, the way we perceive, the things that are going on around us, the way we interact with others. All of, all of our cultures that we bring to this science culture do have an impact. And understanding the impact of those social identities, really students learned about their own social identity, the, the ident social identities of others. They learned, and I think most importantly, that there are certain aspects, certain um, psychosocial factors that influence social interactions, such as implicit bias, imposter syndrome, and stereotype threat. This I think is probably one of the most dramatic results. And it stems from the fact that prior to the course, students had not heard of these concepts before. 
And yet after they were able to define them. And uh, I think probably the most impact comes from quotes from students because what they're saying is, wow, so I knew there was something going on. <laughs> I internalized that. And now I realize that it really isn't about me. It's about these psychosocial factors that are within our culture. And now I have skills to combat them. And in fact, now I have a lexicon to talk about them. One student writes, social factors strongly affect your relationship with peers and mentors, whether or not you consciously recognize it. Always be wary of forming preconceptions about a person and try to put yourself in their shoes whenever you can. Research is about collaboration. It is, a, it is critical that you foster a productive work environment, even if you are the lowest man on the totem pole. Another student wrote, simply placing a name to the feelings I experience almost on the daily and understanding that my successful individual many successful individuals go through the same thing, alleviates my pessimism about what my career as a scientist might look like. So I haven't talked a whole lot about the content of the course and I hope we can do that in the questions. But one thing we did every day besides give introductions was at the end of class, we had a section called takeaways. And this was students' opportunity to tell us three things they learned in that class period, two questions that they still have, and one thing that they would change or that you know didn't work for them. And uh, I thought I'd end today by doing that, reflecting on my experience with the course and the outcomes with the results that we saw. And really the three things that I learned, especially the things that kind of surprised me were that with practice, one can become, uh, one can overcome reluctance to give and receive feedback. So it's been, it had been my experience that Nobody I met ever said that they appreciated or liked feedback. They, they rarely asked for it. And um, really, it was un unwelcome. <laughs> and our students were no different. But I, I really remember this one day. So Bruce Beeren, we're all in class. And someone has just pre presented. And we're giving feedback. And he kind of caught my eye and you know asked me to kind of pipe down my own feedback. And I'm so grateful that he did that because what I was able to observe was that the students were giving and receive, you know, giving all of the feedback themselves, all of the relevant, important feedback that that presenter needed to hear. And that presenter was just taking it in. And there wasn't any of this angst of like, oh my goodness, the judgment, the you know, all of that anxiety that comes from that feedback process. So I think that was, that was one of the most important takeaways that um, the, the, the practice, the normalization of feedback that we did in the course uh, really served the students well. The next is that all students, so we had 70% were from underrepresented uh, groups in science, science, underrepresented in STEM. And then 30% who were you know, overrepresented. But all of the students in the course benefited from this discussion of uh, psychosocial factors um, that have an influence on persistence in STEM. And I, I think you know, I highlighted the importance for that to people who are from underrepresented backgrounds. So people were able to depersonalize those feelings and um, develop new narratives about what was going on. But also I think that the, the, the overrepresented students in the overrepresented groups really now understood the plight of others and uh, didn't like that. 
and wanted to work to make that uh, a non-issue, wanted to work to be allies uh, for those students. So I think that's very important. Next, I think um, we knew that all of these three concepts, the, the science communication, the mentoring, and the psychosocial factors are important. And we wanted to, it, it was important that we keep them together, but we didn't really this, I think until the end grasp how synergistic they all are. You know, the, the more you're able to communicate your science, the, the better your relationship with your mentor, the better your relationship with your mentor, the better your communication with, about the science. And they really all work together. Um, I still want to have better measures to uh, not just rely on self-report to understand the health and evolution of mentoring relationships, as well as um, you know, the impact of just, just knowing about psychosocial factors on one's perception of themselves as a scientist. And finally, I think a, a real crucial part of this work is that uh, mentors matter, they have a huge impact, uh, but we weren't able to measure that impact or you know, the impact of the course on mentors, the impact of having their students undergo the course. And that's something that I, I really would like to do in the future. We had so much help on this project and I wanna thank all of the funding and the people who gave us input on the course content, as well as the content of the manuscript. But really the most, I, I am grateful to our students. Uh, they brought, you know, this is, this is, they are why we do this work. Uh, they brought such joy <laughs> to our classroom, uh, great discussions and thoughtfulness. And, you know, it's, it's been a great joy for us to watch them all go on to do great things. So many of them went on to graduate school um, across the country. We have students at Stanford, Berkeley, um, even right, right here down the road at Harvard. And they really make it clear to me that they belong in science. They are scientists and that if, if we could do just a little bit to help them stay, uh, it's important because we need, we need their ideas uh, and their innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deidre, that was fantastic. I will give you a moment to take a sip of water, take a breath. You're welcome. Um, that was great. I really appreciated learning more about um, your course and the outcomes. Um, and I also really appreciate that there seems to be a clear guiding principle of a growth mindset and kind of everything that you all did with the students. Um, and I am sure that that was really impactful for them. And I'll start us off with a question that's kind of a follow up to something that you highlighted at the end, and then we'll move on to audience questions. So audience, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A and I will um, communicate those to Deidre, but you talked about that importance of feedback. So I'd like a little more detail about how you worked with students to become comfortable with that feedback that might at first feel personal or critical. Right. Um, so I think the key to that is, is this idea that the feedback was normalized. So literally from day one, uh, when students gave their, you know, 30 minute kind of elevator pitch, 30 seconds, <laughs> they, we all went around and, and provided feedback. And I'm sure that first day it was very uncomfortable, but doing that every single day, um, it just becomes normal. But we also incorporated feedback in some of the exercises. So one exercise we have, uh, we give them uh, abstracts that have clearly something wrong with them. And they all read them, but then they pair into groups. And they 
they practice giving feedback to the other person, the other, the other group on their abstract, the quote unquote, their abstract. And then that other group gives them feedback on their feedback. So it, it was really this, um, you know, feedback is an art form. There's a good way to do it. This is how you do it. We, we you know, taught them how to do it. This is how you do it. And uh, yeah, they just got really good at it over time. Great, I love that. So the normalization that feedback is feedback and that practicing feedback is a skill and then allowing them to give feedback on something that wasn't perfect that also wasn't there. So it wasn't personal at first, that's right. great. Um, okay, so we have a few questions from the audience and I'm gonna start with the first one here. So could you talk a little bit more about how you recruited students into this course? I can see how valuable this course would be to students who are conducting independent research, but I imagine it could be difficult for students who are just entering research to realize the value and gaining the skills taught in this course. Right, so we, we really took kind of a three-pronged approach. So be, as, as a training core manager, I was situated where I was having contact with students all the time. Uh, so I would just email blast them or talk to them, you know, hey, I think you, this is really good for you. You're starting out in the lab, that type of thing. So that personal contact. Uh, Adon Colon Carmono also is a director of the IMSD program on campus. So he had contact with students and we have several other training programs. So that was a one huge source. Uh, the next was actually targeting uh, principal investigators uh, and to say, you know, can you distribute this to your students in your lab and encourage them to participate. I think for we presented this as a win-win, right? Um, if students are becoming better at communicating the science, there's a process by which um, just even thinking through their science makes them better in the lab. <laughs> uh, thinking through how to explain it makes them ask better questions and really understand their work more. So I think uh, there was a vested interest in PIs to get their students to do it. And finally, we just really, you know, put up flyers <laughs> across campus. Hey, so then I'm going to ask a question a little bit out of order because it's very much related to what you were just talking about to keep you on the same idea. Some, um, Jana asked a follow up saying, how do you think that learning to give and receive that feedback aided in students ability to engage in science discourse, which you just touched on um, with both peers and mentors? Right. So um, if I understand the correct, that correctly, like did, did this like better at feedback enhance their relationships? Uh, so I don't have any, is that it's, your understanding? It's in, uh, enhance their ability to engage in science discourse. Okay. So I want to say that, so I'm trying to, I'm, I'm pausing now because I'm trying to think if, do I have a, a concrete example that I can give you? And, and I'm not thinking of one right now, um, but I, I do. So we, I talk about how we weren't able to get a lot of feedback from the mentors, but that it wasn't none. It just wasn't ever, is what we wanted. And so we did have a, men, a survey for mentors and we had one response, which <laughs> is crazy, but that one response was so incredible. They, they just went on and on about how the student had opened up. They were so engaged and talking about the science. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if that was directly related to the feedback piece per se, but I know there was an increased comfort level in and a, a less of a, a thinking that, you know, you're going to do the wrong thing. And I think feedback can often help with that or comfort level with feedback can help with that because you know that it's not personal. We're just all working together, trying to, you know, get this right. <laughs> so I, I think, I hope that answers your question. I think it did. Um, and I think you touched on it earlier as well. Um, related to where, where you just moved on to, uh, another attendee asked, how do you address conflicts between mentors and mentees that are rooted from their personality differences? 
Right. So early on, uh, students actually do a, a communication styles inventory. And then they're asked to do this with their mentor. And I think there's like a clear orientation toward difference, like different people prefer, have different communication preferences, communicate in different ways. And all of these are okay. And you can tailor your own communication to um, reduce misunderstandings and make sure that your message lands. De, you know, depending on that other person's communication style. So they, they just really get good at communicating in general, which I think alleviates some of the issues. Uh, but then we, we talk to them very directly. Uh, so there, there's a, a lot of literature on, you know, difficult conversations. We bring in uh, books about difficult conversations and practice difficult conversations. In, in a scenario format. So one scenario is, you know, maybe you've done something in the, like someone has, someone has done something in the lab where they left all of their things out and left the lab <laughs> and didn't, you know, didn't clean up after themselves or some, you know, there's some scenario. And then we, we talk through how to address the communication around that scenario. And, you know, students are, students are very good at it. I think the problem is that comfort level. Oftentimes culturally, it's like in my culture, I am not supposed to confront anybody or <laughs> address anything directly. So um, we talk about really kind of compartmentalizing and, you know, at home, maybe I wouldn't do that, but at work, it's, it's very important that I develop the skills and the comfort level for doing that or articulate that that's not my comfort level. Yeah, so really normalizing those conversations and practicing them. Right. Great, thank you, um, I appreciate that. Okay, this next question switches gears a little bit. So. Um, Shannon says, really interesting that you recorded all of their practice talks and that students trusted that process. I'm curious if students watch their own practice talks. Also, did you face any pushback against video recording? Faculty are often resistant to this, so I'm interested in making less anxiety around it for people. And thank you very much for sharing your work. So I don't, no one ever said anything about recording. Again, it, it fell into that uh, feedback realm. So we, we basically said we're recording and we want you to uh, be able to view yourself and critique yourself. And they were all fine with that. I think it's very difficult for us all to watch ourselves. So that was probably the only difficulty. Um, yep. I think it sounds like it's all in the framing. Um, we have another question in the chat, um, wondering how the students were assessed for their work in the course from Rachel. So you're talking about uh, just the, the actual grading and not the evaluation of the course content. I, I think so, because it says, it says assessed for their work in the course. So I, I think they're wondering about how they were assigned points and grades and things for participating. Right, so with the, um, with the paper, so I, I, want, I want to preface this answer by saying we taught this course in 2016, 17, and 18, and I have since gone on <laughs> to something very different. So the syllabus itself is, is in, in the supplemental materials of the paper that explains the grading, but essentially there was like a heavy um, like participation component where turning in their assignments and actually uh, doing the work, like presenting had a, a huge, was a huge component. Great. So in the supplements and a lot of participation points and things. Right. And, and I know that you did kind of a flip model where they did the readings and then they came prepared to, 
discuss and engage. Yes. So they, you know, they had homework that they turned in that was checked off um, and they received feedback on, on those things. Um, Mostly discussion questions regarding articles that we had them read. Uh, We also, um, you know, we, we did grade their like final presentations and things like that, but the main, the main thing was the participation. Perfect. Okay. Um, People are very interested in feedback. I'm going to get back to feedback for for another question here. So um, this participant or attendee says, usually when a feedback is asked from students, they try to escape it. But how did you manage to get the feedback? And then in parentheses, what strategy did you use to know the truth of their subconscious feedback? I would like to know how feedback should be given and evaluated. Wow. I... I want to make sure I'm really answering your question. I'm not sure. Um, maybe could you repeat the question? Yeah. So I think I think this person is getting at. So I'll just repeat it um, instead of trying to interpret. Usually, when feedback when a feedback is asked from students, they try to escape it. But how did you manage to get the feedback? Um, what strategy did you use to know the truth of their subconscious feedback? I would like to know how a feedback should be given and evaluated. I think maybe they're getting at the coaching of giving honest feedback. Right. And- the, I, I'm not sure about the subconscious part. And maybe if you could put in the chat, maybe what you mean by subconscious feedback. But I think the difference between the feedback in the course and the, the, the feedback in other contexts is that this this was really billed as just part of the course <laughs> like like we're learning to do it and not necessarily um i'm just giving you feedback so it's a they you know they went through a lot to understand how to do it and how how to do it effectively and i think they all bought into that like it it worked and if you're doing it effectively, it really does depersonalize it. You're focusing on critiquing the actual presentation or whatever you're working on and not the person. Right. And once, once you learn that process, you know that, so you're less resistant to it. That's great. I, I think that that gets it. I haven't seen a follow-up. So my guess is, is you got to the heart of that question. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Amanda, and this question says, did the mentors receive any training or readings to complement the training the students received? Is there a contract or agreed set of expectations about the mentor-mentee relationship, um, or was most of your training student-focused? Right, so the, the very first semester, we, um, it was myself, all of the instructors, as well as I want to say like 90% of the the mentors actually did an entering mentoring day long uh, eight module training. Uh, And then the instructors in the course went on to do the mentor training. So we're all trained mentor trainers. And then we brought that, we, the, the people at UMass Boston brought that training back and would train mentors in our training programs as well as we started a, uh, a, a monthly series, uh, Mentor Mondays. And we just come and talk about uh, different topics that groups of mentors would come. So that, that first semester, yes, we definitely train people. Subsequent semesters, we didn't have as much uh, mentors have interest in training. I, I wonder if part of that was, um, the majority of the mentors in our first class were graduate students and they literally came to every class. So we had this wonderful, uh, like I just remember one of the mentors saying how much she struggled with science pre- presentation and how she, what process she went through to get better and that it's still a struggle, but if she does the things that she needs to do to quell the nerves, she can, she can deliver the talk and you could just see the students light up like, wow, you're just like me. <laughs> and, and it just really, um, I know a lot of undergraduate students, they hold their, 
mentors in such esteem that it, it prevents the relationship from actually taking place. But having the mentors in the classroom sharing their experiences and having those experiences resonate really did bring the students closer and enhance those relationships. So first semester, yes, we trained. And first semester, yes, we had a lot more engagement and they were both beneficial. Great, thank you. Um, and people, folks are appreciating um, having mentors in the class as a really cool component of that. Um, we did have a response about the subconscious feedback. So if you don't mind, okay. I, can, yeah. I can pop you back to that. So um, Rachna says, subconscious feedback is when a student th thought of telling something, but it happened to be something else. Mm. I, I'm so because that's like unconscious, I don't know if I have a way of knowing if students did help hold back. But I think what was also helpful is we, and I, and I haven't mentioned it, we had different modes of communicating feedback. And one of them was anonymous. So, and it was, it was actually almost accidental because we really didn't have time at the end for everybody to give a full presentation and to give full oral feedback. So we had these sheets of feedback and there were different areas that people had to provide feedback. And then you would just hand the sheets <laughs> to the person and they can go through them themselves. And I think in that way, they probably were less inclined to hold back. Great, thank you for jumping back to that, appreciate it. Um, so here's a, a slightly longer question um, from Aaron. So how would you like to get data beyond self-report? In my program, we use, we've used self-report both at the time and retrospectively to chart what topic skills um, they need and when. We work with portfolio documents that are looking at tracking the development of the documents and we're serving this, um, their near peer mentors. So this person would like to know what data you'd like to see gathered to help understand and communicate how underrepresented students in STEM develop with this type of support and or what skills and training are needed to navigate academic STEM culture? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I have an answer. I think we, we did try to uh, collect data that were, you know, not self-report. Uh, so you, you saw a little bit of that in terms of using the rubrics and having graders um, assess the work. That was one way. Uh, it was, I think it was more difficult for us to get a baseline for things. So one early attempt we did was have the student on the pre-survey write an abstract of their work. I think that was very difficult because you know, as you saw when I saw, showed the demographic slide, students were coming into this at very different places in their research. <laughs> so you might on the same survey have someone who has just started their research than the day before, <laughs> and then someone who's been in that same lab for two years. So they might know how to write an abstract, but they don't have the material and that's gonna be a big barrier for them to actually write that abstract, like a pre-version. The, we did do that and showed that in the paper uh, with um, ability to define. So we figured, you know, a, a definition is something that we could grade and test for accuracy that's independent of someone's uh, perceptions or, or their attitudes toward a certain thing, but I would welcome any ideas that people have or things that people have seen. Um, yeah, thank you. And Erin, if you have other suggestions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll share them with Deidre. Um, so we have another question. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go back here. So oh, I will say, I will yeah, say that there are, other, there are other measures like, um, like a, like a self-efficacy scale and, and things like that, that we started. But the time frame of the course, I think is too short to really see those types of changes as well. 
So there's, <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah, lots but I of think options. we could get there, right? Great. <clears throat> yes, it's hard. It's hard to know. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if oh, so the same person that asked the question does have a follow up. Um, we have that too. The skills coming in vary so much, so there needs to be a way to track level of development rather than level of performance. That makes right. So what, not everyone's starting at the same spot. So how do we right. track their progress? And that's a great question. Thank you for posing that for all of us to think about. Um, another uh, attendee wanted to know if there was any, um, Ariadna wants to know, are there, is there any financial assistance for students who wanted to take the course but had financial constraints? Yeah, so since this was just a two credit course and like so students were already paying tuition, one thing um, I didn't mention before is that the course kind of evolved over time it, it was a dinner seminar when we first started. I, I think that might've been why all the graduate students attended. <laughs> sure. um, they were just probably in the lab and just come downstairs to have dinner. Um, and, and then over time, we, we reduced the number of people teaching the course. Uh, so it went from four to two and we, it was just like a regular you know, morning, 90 minute class twice a week. So hopefully students could take it as part of their regular course. course. Right. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here from Mara that says, of the assigned readings you used, which ones provoked particularly fruitful or memorable discussion? And if you were to replace readings, what would you replace with this with, them with? And uh, they say, thank you. I think um, to answer the first part of the question, uh, there's the Moss and Rakusin article. I think that resonated a lot with the students because the, they're dealing with like the same age range. So if you're pay, applying for a technician job and what my name, my name is gonna make a difference. Are you kidding me? There was outrage <laughs> and a lot of discussion around. So what do you do about it? Like as, as an individual, you can't do anything uh, per se because that your name is your name. <laughs> For those who aren't um, familiar with that study, do you want to live a, give a tiny bit of context? Right. So um, the, the study basically had like same resumes <laughs> and they changed the name and gave them to a set of faculty to apply for a, um, like a technician job. And uh, depending on the name, <laughs> if the name was like an ethnic sounding name, they were or, or a female name, they were paid less. Like if they were actually gonna be hired, they would recommend to pay less, but then they were actually recommended for hiring less. Um, I hope I'm getting that right, but the, yes, the students were outraged. Uh, and then remind me of the second part of that question. Yes, rightfully so, thank you. The second part was, if you were to replace readings, what would you replace them with? Right, I wouldn't necessarily replace readings, but even my, my own um, knowledge in this area has grown over time. So I think I would expand the curriculum to include microaggressions, for example, and, and how to deal with them. Uh, and there are like a few other things, maybe a little bit more in depth with social identities and uh, intersectionality. And that leads right into another question about if you were to design the course again, um, what changes would you make, if any? So if there are any other ideas um, outside of the, the papers. Uh, I think in, in each increasing iteration, we um, increase our treatment of the mentoring relationships and the social identities. So um, if there's a, the last figure in the paper <laughs> that shows that you know, the science communication is the, the thing we, we deal with the most. And I, I would like to see us have more of an equal distribution of how much we talk about each because they, they really are, uh, they really do work together as concepts. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that you got it, a lot of this question here from Emma, but I'll, I'll ask it in case there is something that you wanted to add. You mentioned having students engage with their research mentors in a communication exercise. 
So they're curious if mentee mentor exercises were a regular component of the course and what other engagement was expected for research mentors of the course, uh, research mentors of students in the course. Right, so like I said, that, that first, so it, there's what happened. So like there's the, there's the things that happened in the first semester that they were, we were excited that mentors um, came to. And then there were the expectations. So I think that the main expectations were for, for mentors to review the work of the students. So the students, in addition to receiving feedback from their peers and instructors in the course, they also receive feedback from their mentors, on, mainly for that like accuracy of the science. And um, they probably also gave feedback about how things were structured. And that was everything from abstracts to the actual presentations and slide decks. Uh, many mentors did come to the practice final presentations to give feedback on how the students were presenting the work. Yeah, it's too bad. Did, did you did you identify active resistance to the in the later cohorts, or was it just kind of a, just not present in the way that the first iteration was? I wish I really wish I knew what the difference yeah. was. For example, we I mean we did the same things each semester. We started with a mentor orientation where we explain the course and they, they get an understanding of what we're gonna be asking of them. And then that they're invited to certain like important classes, like, like the, the presentation practices. And for whatever reason, every mentor showed up to that first orientation. <laughs> and then one, no, two mentors showed up in the second semester. And I, I just don't have an explanation for it. Uh, we would all love to know what we could do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a couple more questions um, from Erin. So one of them is, how do you think the format, dinner seminar versus regular class, affected the course experience? So I'll, I'll have you address that one first. It's probably a shorter answer than the second question. Right, I'm trying to think, I, I really, so you're you're hanging everything on the food. We had breakfast at the <laughs> at the other the morning class. We had breakfast, so there were there was always food. Um, I I think part the difference is. So we we went from four instructors to two instructors. That was one difference, and that didn't cause a problem. Um. I think it was helpful to have things broken up a little bit. So with the dinner seminar, we met, I think it was once a week and sort of everything for that week happened on one day. Whereas the other class met twice a week. I think that made a difference to have those two touch points and have thought in between. Great. And somebody appreciates your clarifying about breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're also thinking about the food. Okay, I think that we have time for one last question. I think this is um, perfect timing. Erin um, also asked, what would you include on microaggressions and bias to find the balance between affirming and demoralizing undergraduate students, i.e. affirming the experience is real and offering skills and tools versus triggering stereotype threat or making STEM careers seem hard to achieve, et cetera. I feel like that latter part of the question was like the answer. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, or am I, Erin, am I missing? <laughs> um, I think they're asking, you know, how, how would you kind of find that balance between triggering students versus affirming that this is, that yet, yet microaggressions happen, yet you can be affirmed in this experience and have skills to, to right. handle them. I, uh, I think just before we came on, we were kind of talking about this a little bit. And so oftentimes students would start out with, you know, how, how is this relevant <laughs> to science, right? Because, you know, as, as even as a scientist, it shouldn't be, we're, we're like objective thinkers. We, 
these things shouldn't matter. It's just about the science, <laughs> but that's not true. We bring ourselves. And what students realized after learning the concepts is that they could see these playing out in their own lives. And I, I think that's, that's the important part that once they recognize that this is what's happening to me. And then they have now a skill to combat it. They're, they're so grateful. Right. So they're, they, they knew they were happening. They may not have had the words or known how normal it was to feel those things, but now they have the ability to. Absolutely. That's I'm glad you said that, uh, this, this idea of having the words and, and being able to have a shared lexicon. So even discussing the articles became very easy for students by the end uh, to talk amongst like something, things that could be uncomfortable conversations now that they, now they could talk among themselves about it uh, in, in very diverse groups. So I, th I think it's, uh, it's another way that practice kind of played out in the course. Yeah, that's huge. We could all use that even now, I think. So absolutely. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, okay, so we are two minutes out. So um, we do have a slide for you folks to um, encourage you to put some notes in the chat this time um, to just a brief assessment for LSE. If you could use the chat to write one interesting thing that you learned during today's session, there are already things in the chat. This has been an amazing conversation, Deidre. I really appreciate your insight and you sharing with us and being willing to have very little breaths between answering all of these great questions. <laughs> um, so folks, if you don't mind, um, just popping something interesting that you found into the chat, that would be great. Um, and then one other thing into the chat, if you wanna um, slide forward one more, Deidre. Um, if you could also like to, if you would like to suggest other LSE papers, authors, or topics that you would like to see us feature in online with LSE, myself and um, Mark would love to find out what you all would like to see more of on online with LSE. And please mark your calendars for the next online with LSE, Friday, April 15th with Dustin Toman, who will be discussing diversity interventions in the classroom from resistance to action. So a lot of great things popping up in the chat. I just want to thank you so much, Deidre, for your time and your work um, and sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure.